2018-2021 UCEAP Faculty Director of Chile and Argentina, and currently is residing in Santiago, the capital of Chile. Javiera is certainly a citizen of the world. You'll be interested to know that she was born in Santiago and her father worked for the World Bank and so the family moved around while she was growing up. When she was seven, her family moved to the Washington DC area, lived for nearly a decade. And at age 16, her family moved to Beijing and Javiera lived there until she graduated from high school. From Beijing, Javiera studied political science as an undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh. And during that time, she also studied abroad in Grenoble, France through the EU's Erasmus program. And, and I sort of say study abroad in quotes because one could really view Javiera's life as a series of multiple education abroad experience. After receiving her BA, Javiera lived in Madrid for several years, and from Madrid, she then moved back to the US, this time to the West Coast, where she received her master's in public policy from UC Berkeley, and then her PhD in environmental science policy and management also from Berkeley. With her multidisciplinary academic background, Professor Barandiaran's research explores the intersection between science, environment, and development in Latin America. She has received research grants from, from the prestigious Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council. She has written extensively about Chilean democ democracy and environmental politics, and her first book titled Science and Environment in Chile the Politics of Expert Advice in a Neoliberal Democracy was published in two, 2018 by MIT Press. Um, let me also share a few other publication titles that reflect the range of Javiera's interests and expertise. Water Use and Conflicts, California Oil, Bridging the Gaps Between Local Decision Making and State Level Climate Action researching race in Chile. And um, the last one that I'll share is environmental justice, knowledge, technology, and expertise. And this was a chapter in the handbook for science and technology studies. I asked Javiera, what are some things that most people probably don't know about you? And she replied, you know, people tend to not know that I'm not a US citizen, that I am Chilean and Argentinian. My family is Argentinian and immigrated to Santiago and in fact opened the very first Argentinian bakery and cafe in Santiago. Javiera's hobbies include biking and hiking. And as a cycling enthusiast, she rides a Bronton folding bike. I'm told it's a James Bond type of bike, a Rolls Royce of folding bikes. So when she returns to Santa Barbara, one of her goals is ride is to write to the very top of Gibraltar. So without further ado, let's give Professor Javier Barandiaran a warm virtual UCAP welcome. It's that hand clapping option in your Zoom. All right, here we go. Well, thank you, Shusu. Everyone can hear me, I hope. Yes? yes. OK, great. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Um, Yes, there's, I guess there's a lot more we can talk about there. Um, so I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Bryn and Elizabeth, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, to the UCEAP alumni. It's a real honor. Um, so I'm very happy to be here uh, you know, sharing part of my research, part of my work, part of my experience. I guess one thing I'll say in relation to, to what Shusu's introduction is that when I began my dissertation research in 2008 here in Chile, in many ways, I also felt like a foreigner coming to Chile and sort of seeing it for the very first time, in, in large part because it was the very first time that I was really moving outside of Santiago and, um, and sort of, you know, romping through the entire country trying to do interviews with scientists and activists and communities. Um, so so in, in some ways, I often feel like uh, like some of our students, I can relate to some of those feelings of coming to Chile for the first time, even though I've been here my whole life also. Uh, it's a strange situation to be in. Anyway, today I'm talking about constitutional reform in Chile. This is an extremely exciting bit of a roller coaster process uh, that is only just beginning. 
uh, even though sometimes we feel like we've been doing it for a long time already, but really the, the, the biggest challenges lie ahead of us. Um, so today I'm going to talk first about how we got to this point. So just give everyone a little bit of the, the re recent political history in Chile. Um, then I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, the estallido, um, sort of the events a year ago that kicked this all off. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the plebiscite that happened just a few weeks ago on October 25th. And I'll finish with some reflections on some of the challenges that we face uh, now as a Chilean um, society. So let's see. So uh, between 1973 and 1990, Chile was governed by a military dictatorship led by Augusto Pinochet, pictured here on the right in military uniform. And in 1980, his government imposed a constitution which is still in place today. For many, this lack of democratic legitimacy alone is enough reason for constitutional reform. In 1990, so after 17 years of dictatorship, in 1990, Chile transitioned back to democracy. And one year ago in 2019 is when we lived this social uprising, which has come to be called the estallido. So estallido is a word I'll be using regularly to refer to the social uprising. So in essence, I argue that this uprising was a protest against inequality and all of its manifestations and the forms of institutionalized violence that this inequality uh, sort of leads to. So Chile is an extremely uh, unequal country in terms of income. So over the last 30 years, the economy has boomed. It has grown by 252%. You know, the, growth of GDP compared to just 43% GDP growth in Latin America. Um, but in 2015, for example, a quarter of that wealth, 24%, went to just the top 1%, the richest 1% of Chileans. So that's a very large amount of inequality. Um, about 20%, the 20% of Chileans who have stable jobs, professional jobs, for example, when we talk about pensions, um, they can access relatively, you know, pretty good pensions. But for the 80% who are stuck in low wage jobs, in jobs with zero uh, labor protections, because there's really no labor code here, um, those people are left with pensions that pay less than minimum wage. So 80% of pensions pay less than minimum wage. At the same time that the private corporations that manage these pensions make huge profits for the corporate owners who own these companies, three of which are now, um, there's only six left, and three of them are owned by U.S. companies. What we see in pensions, we see it in education, in health, in all kinds of areas that were privatized under the military government. Environmental destruction and environmental burdens are also very unevenly distributed. So here we have a map of Santiago. The blue areas are the high income or high socioeconomic status areas. Uh, you know, Las Condes, Providencia. Uh, these will be very familiar to all our alumni. Um, and so you see sort of the very extreme sort of a spatial segregation that exists in the city. I wanted to share this book um, that I came across recently for anyone interested in inequality and poverty in Chile, not just today, but with a historical perspective. This is by an Uruguayan historian, Javier Rodriguez Weber. You can actually download the book online. Um, and it's a really fabulous book because he makes this very key point that, you know, Chile has always been highly unequal and there's always been a lot of poverty, but even so, inequality today is worse than when poverty was much higher. And, and the responsibility that the democratic governments have of the last 30 years since the transition to democracy in not implementing any kind of serious, serious policies for uh, wealth redistribution. And so that's why at the Estallido, what we heard is it's not 30 pesos, which was the, the increase in the, subware, in the subway fare hike that triggered it all, it's 30 years. So this was just the last straw of a long range of, um, of grievances. Um, so the main outcome of the estallido, uh, tangible outcome so far, has been this constitutional reform process. And you might very well be wondering, how is constitutional reform going to uh, improve pensions, improve education, improve health, which are the three main things that people demand again and again on the streets? 
And it's, it's a fair question. Um, so here this slide summarizes um, what I think are the main weaknesses of the current constitution and why it needs to be reformed. Um, so first, the first two are related, weak social rights, but strong business rights. So for example, the 1980 constitution does not recognize a right to education, but rather a right to choose where you will receive your education. It also recognizes the right of businesses um, and the right and protects private property. So in practice, education entrepreneurs have more constitutional protection than students. And this happens with water and water users, with health and in many, many other areas. Points three and four are also related. It is almost impossible under the current constitution to change major laws or to change the constitution itself because these require super majorities in the legislature. So if the 1980 Constitution places what have been called locks and bolts on the democratic process, and that's actually a technical term I can talk more about in the Q&A. Um, so for example, this year uh, there was a proposal to declare water a public good in order to regulate it in the context of a drought. And this was defeated even though around 60% of legislators voted in favor because it needed 67 support or more to pass, right? So that's a good example of how Something with strong majority support still fails. And then finally, the 1980 Constitution creates a subsidiary state that can only do what it is expressly allowed to do and is thus relegated to acting like an umpire that enforces the rules. Governance is imagined like a game, uh, but one in which players with money and resources can do many more things than those without them. And above all, no one has the resources, the authority, or the legitimacy to articulate or to promote shared goals. So in a subsidiarity state, there is no notion of the common good. And so for me, these are all good enough reasons for reform, um, but it will remain to the government to improve pensions, education, health, and all of those things. And, and I think most people realize that. The 1980 Constitution is a neoliberal one, and this here is just a small selection of books that analyze the influence of neoliberal political thought in Chile. So neoliberalism has been developed over decades by economists and wealthy donors. Uh, neoliberals argue two main things. First, that the market is the one and only best way to organize all human activity, no exceptions. And second, that markets must be protected from democracy. Hence, democracy must be limited. And we see both of these ideas very clearly in the 1980 Constitution, in part because Chile was a pioneer in translating neoliberal ideas into policy. And since the 1970s, neoliberalism has, has gone global and we see it in lots of different governance systems. So this brings us to the estallido. And what I wanna say is part of what made this such a watershed moment is that it was massive and it was unorganized. It really came from the streets. There were no leaders then and there are no leaders now. Um, it was transversal. You could hear pots banging in Las Condes and other wealthy, wealthy neighborhoods. Um, and so here you see a photo of Plaza Italia or heading south down the Alameda. Um, as night was falling, you can see some of the arson, you can see some of the tear gas. Um, and it all began with this subway fare hike that I mentioned earlier, um, and high school students, um, you know, evading the fare, and they triggered what what you know they triggered a protest against that fare. It quickly escalated. That was on Friday. By Saturday, the streets were filled with protesters. Here you see young people, you see older people, um, no mas AFP that, re that is speaking to the pensions reform. It was, uh, there was violence. Um, so here you see a, a looted store. There were, there were several acts of violence um, that happened. But, um, so protesters began receiving support from some lawmakers, as you can see here, but then President Piñera, that's on the left, he threw fuel on the fire uh, by declaring a few days after a weekend of protests that the country was, quote, at war with an internal enemy. Two days later on a Friday, um, this march happened, the largest march in Chilean uh, history, about a million and a half people were there, and you can read on the flag, it says, no estamos en guerra, we're not at war. 
Um, and so then this, this is Plaza Italia officially, and they, the activists got Google Maps to relabel it Plaza Dignidad, so Dignity Square. It was also a moment of intense creativity. Um, so this is a photo of the feminist collective Las Tesis during their protest performance piece, which addresses gender-based violence and translates roughly into uh, a rapist in your path. Uh, thus subverting an old slogan of the Chilean police. And this piece, and with it, many aspects of the Chilean estallido went global. So briefly, how did this impact us and our wonderful students, uh, which we miss you all so much. Um, so at the time, there were 66 UC students in Chile in three programs, uh, Chilean University's Human Rights and um, Socioecological Sustainability based in Villarrica. And the most common comment I heard from them, the overwhelming sentiment was one of feeling a real sense of privilege of being here to experience all of this. Many found it really inspiring. And I, I do know there may be some fall 2019 alumni listening right now who had a different experience or maybe only later realized how stressful it all really was. Maybe it hit you later. And if so, I am sorry uh, for those experiences. And if you want to reach out afterwards, I'm happy to talk um, more. We certainly faced a lot of challenging situations. We were very concerned about student safety because as you see here, there were a lot of human rights abuses which are still under investigation. Um, students in the Chilean universities program were the most impacted. Um, so here is a photo of the Campus San Joaquin of the Catholic University where most students were studying at that time. And on several locations, protesters clashed with police who fired tear gas canisters directly into campus. Um, and these were uh, very random events. You know, it, so this hadn't happened since the coup. Um, so it was very shocking that this happened. Um, but the truth is that for weeks, those of us who live in Providencia and commuted to San Joaquin or into the city center, you kind of never knew when you emerged from the metro what you were going to find, if you were going to find tear gas, police, et cetera. Um, we had to, they, the Chilean university students had classes and sometimes internships disrupted and we worked with each of them to make sure they could finish the semester successfully. Human rights students, they were also very impacted. We moved them to a safer campus so they were able to continue with their classes. We had to move some of the field trips, you know, cancel one or two. Um, but on the plus side, their professor, Hugo Rojas, I want to give a shout out to him because he designed some really cool activities for students to participate safely in the estallido. So they made a pamphlet on how to identify fake news, um, materials for teachers on uh, popular education and human rights programs. And he's emailed me recently that he's actually written a book manuscript based on the intellectual exchange he had with our students and just say that he's so thankful for that chance that he was teaching them at that time. Um, it was very enriching to him. And then students in Villarrica, I think, were, fared, uh, were, were spared the worst. Um, there was, it was fairly quiet there from what I've heard. Uh, so this is just uh, the farewell lunch we, we had. So you can see them all smiling. Thankfully, no one suffered any physical injuries. Um, we had, yeah, and we do, we do miss you all. Uh, so the plebiscite, um, so 80% voted to approve the uh, constitutional reform and even more importantly to reform the constitution through a constitutional convention. Um, approval was highest amongst uh, the urban working class, so, so Santiago Southern Periphery, for those of you familiar with La Pintana, Puente Alto, support there was almost unanimous. Um, young people, voters under age 30, 35, also almost unanimous support. Uh, participation was lower um, in, the, in the rural South, Araucanía, El Maule, for a number of reasons we can discuss if, if people are interested. So the big thing now is that um, the constitutional, the, the, the next year is going to be crazy for Chilean voters, for Chilean political parties, and it is a political scientist's dream come true. If you study electoral dynamics, come here now because we're going to the polls twice. First, on April 11th to vote for representatives of the Constitutional Convention, but also mayors, local representatives, and for the very first time ever in Chilean history, regional governors. This is a huge deal. 
Then in November, we're going to the polls again for presidential and legislative elections. So two major elections. Political parties to fill all of these positions have to mobilize 15,000 candidates. So the logistical and the financial effort is enormous, tremendous. They've never had, they've never had to do anything like this before. Um, and we face a number of challenges um, as, we, as we go ahead in, into doing this. Um, many question marks still about how is this really going to happen. So first, who will the representatives in the Constitutional Convention be? Um, Trust in public in political parties in Chile has been historically very low since the 1990s, very, very low. And there is this expectation, there always has been, that it would be regular people uh, who would be at the Constitutional Convention, that it wouldn't be professional politicians. Um, and so, the, you know, that, but there, there's, there's this big question about how this will happen because political parties, they don't have grassroots organizing and, and they've become very elite. It's upper class individuals that really belong and are militants in, in political parties. Uh, just this week, uh, this woman, Ruth Olate Moreno, um, announced her candidacy and she is a uh, domestic worker, has been an activist for domestic worker rights. And I think she's the kind of person we all want to see at the convention, but we don't know how this exactly will happen. Um, the other question is, how is public participation really going to happen? Chile does not have much experience with this. This week, Camila Vallejo, a uh, legislator, presented a proposal to try to institutionalize more participation in the Constitutional Convention. She's faced a lot of pushback for different reasons from uh, right-wing parties and from the president. Um, so there's a lot of questions about how this is really going to happen and who's going to implement this. And then finally, what is the Constitution going to include? Um, there's so many issues people want to see you reformed um, that this is, you know, this is my attempt here to try to organize them a little bit. Um, there's probably more out there. And I've been in some conversations with environmental organizations. And, and I can tell you that right now, the sense of is, is that this is overwhelming. It's overwhelming how many things we want to do and um, how few people we are to do them in a way. Um, so I will leave it there. Uh, you can read the slide on your own and I'm happy to take questions and have a conversation because I imagine there's a lot of people who are familiar with some of these things that want to talk. All right, thank you so much, Javiera. Um, Let's move over to the chat and let me see, or Bryn, you can also help me to see if there are any uh, questions right now. Um, As of right now, there are no questions, but we can begin with your questions and people can begin submitting them. Sure. You know, I, I didn't point out that um, Professor Barandiran is also a faculty affiliate for both CSB's Latin America and Iberian Studies program, as well as the interdepartmental PhD emphasis in environmental studies. And as you, as I mentioned, as you can see, you know, um, Javiera has multidisciplinary academic interests. While we're, oh, I, I do, I'll, I'll wait on my own question. Um, so, Del uh, let's see. Yeah, I think. Mazar Claire Penzen asks um, if you would elaborate on the point about rural residents showing lower participation. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I'm going to link it with Allison's questions about disillusioned voters from southern Chile and, and um, the question there of, of indigenous populations, because that area, as, as some of you probably know, um, is, is also the area where, where land conflict between Mapuche and um, sort of settler non-Mapuche populations is very high. Um, and there's a couple, I've been reading some articles about this. I'm not an expert on this area, but what, what I'm reading is that one, there, there could be an, a COVID effect um, you know, rural populations, harder to get to the polls. Um, this, this area was, has been really hard hit this last month or two with COVID. So they had a cuarentena, like Villarrica has been in cuarentena after 
um, avoiding the worst of COVID, they've been in total lockdown um, since September, since after the September 18th holiday. Temuco, Villarrica, that whole area, so total lockdown. And there was confusion uh, over whether people were allowed to go out and vote. Um, so that's one, you know, just COVID effects, fear of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Second, um, this is an area where the, the po politics has, has a history of being very personalized. Um, and people go out and vote for their mayors and for their local representatives. And so in the absence of that, there wasn't that um, organization to take people to the polls and there wasn't that um, uh, motivation to go support your person, right? Your guy, your, your woman, usually a guy. Um, so that's one issue. Another one, I do think we don't have, I haven't seen any like polls about this or any statistics or any more careful analysis, but I do think, you know, this is an area that um, historically has tended to vote conservative because it has been the, the, the you know, the non-Mapuche, the settler communities are, are the majority um, and they go to the votes and they, they vote. Um, and so this has tended to vote, vote uh, conservative precisely in part, you know, they fear any redistribution of power that might empower the Mapuche communities that live there. Plurinationalism is at the top of my list here um, in the redistribution of power. I think that there is quite a lot of support for, for plurinationalism um, amongst sort of the 60, 70% of Chileans that aren't um, living in Araucanía um, and that, uh, um, yeah, and that want a more, more equitable society. And, but we still, you know, we still don't have delegates, the reserve delegates for indigenous people. Um, so this constitutional convention is historic because it's the first one worldwide to have gender parity. Um, we can talk about, you know, if, 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 you know, biological quotas is the right way to do this or not, but it will have gender parity. But since January, Congress has been debating a law to uh, have special delegates for indigenous peoples, and they have not passed that yet. Um, it's almost there, but the right wing continues to hold it up, basically. Okay, um, we have Delilah, who is a 2018 um, Argentina Chile student here to ask, has there been threats from the 1% about taking their money and leaving Chile? Um, not that I have heard or that's been reported on Twitter or the media. I am reading more about the pensions in a way. It's, you know, that ship has sailed. Uh, because pensions, a couple of years ago, the pension law was changed so that pension um, uh, accounts could be invested abroad by the private pension companies. And keep in mind that between the six of them, these pension, uh, they, they have assets that are equivalent to about something like 75% of Chilean GDP, right? They have the savings of all of Chile. And now they can invest them anywhere in the world. Um, and so, so that, that ship has sailed, basically. They've taken their money abroad. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> okay. They still have a lot of landed assets here that they can't transfer that Thank easily. You. Josephine, who is a 20, from the 2019 Chilean Argentina cohort, um, would like to know if the book manuscript by Hugo is available to the public. You know, you had the other book which you can download, right? Um, is this one available to the public in that way? Well, I'm curious because Hugo told me he was going to email you all. Um, so it sounds like he has or he hasn't, um, but he's shared the manuscript with me. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to follow up with him and see what's happened. He actually wanted to organize like a meeting or a seminar, um, but he, we, you know, we, we haven't kept up that conversation, but, you know, we should do that. So I will follow up with him. But you should e feel free to email me and keep this conversation going. Okay. And Macy, Macy, I didn't know you were uh, a cohort of 2002 Canada and 2004 South Korea. Um, Macy says the Constitutional Convention and the rest of the world could really benefit from also looking at concepts of partnership and um, provides a link there. Um, Allison Ryan, the 2013 uh, Chile cohort, um, says, 
Were regional governors previously appointed or are those new political offices? They were previously appointed by the president. So Chile is probably one of the most centralized democracies in the world. The president appoints the ministers, who appoint the ministerial representatives in each region, and he appoints, you know, usually him, but yeah, like well, I guess Chile twice, um, they appoint the regional governors. And the regional governors, of course, then appoint the entire. So it is very presidentialist, not just in terms of uh, the president's powers to initiate laws, et cetera, et cetera, but also because that person appoints everyone. And, and so the regional, the voting of the regional governors, I think is gonna have massive consequences for Chilean politics and parties. And, and to the, and the extent that I think a lot of people here don't fully grasp yet, you know, at least for me coming from the United States, um, you know, it has a huge impact on, on political trajectories. And so that will be really interesting to see over a long term, how that changes the balance of power across regions. Hey, and our UCAP Study Center director from Spain, Cristina, asks, um, comments that I see a lot of similarities in some Hispanic countries with, quote, imperfect transitions from dictatorship to democracy, for example, Chile, Argentina, Spain, and so forth. Um, what would be, in your opinion, a game-changing action for Chile today? Well, I think constitutional reform that is, that is you know, recognizing plurinationalism, um, you know, I'm working with environmentalists, that's where I work. Um, so we're debating a lot about rights of nature or a, an ecological constitution. Um, as I've talked about this with different colleagues, I like to say, you know, Pinochet would be like, you know, flipping in his grave if, if with a plurinational state and rights of nature, like, that is radical, radical compared, you know, to the country where you know, that I was born into. Um, so I think, but I think we also, the world has changed since 2008 when Ecuador and Bolivia passed their constitutions that were, you know, very radical and progressive at that time. And so I, I asked myself, what, what is the really pioneering thing to be doing here? And, and there are people in Chile at the University of Chile, for example, professors who are working on things like digital rights and um, privacy and the right to information and education in in the digital world that we live in today um and i think you know in terms of imperfect transitions it's worth remembering that at the time chile was applauded by everyone as as an example tr uh, transition to democracy it was peaceful it was stable it preserved economic growth etc cetera, etc cetera. so um yeah, so it, it's been applauded through and through. Only in the last few years have the, the problems in the system become apparent to, um, to, to those outside of academia and those outside of the working class that were suffering in these ways. Thank you. We have um, the next question is from Julian, who's a 2018 Chilean alum. Um, how has the large amount of immigration over the past several years been affecting the dynamic you're seeing now? That's a great question, and the short answer is I don't know. Um, and, and it is worth noting just how dramatic the change in migration is and has been. Um, you know, ten, less than 10 years ago, eight years ago, you would not see a single black person on the streets of Santiago. Um, and, and, and it's been a bit surprising to me how um, little, I see um, in the public discussion about immigrants and immigrant rights, there was during the pandemic a discussion of a new immigration law. Um, I don't know exactly what happened to that. I think it, it kind of didn't move anywhere. There's also been, um, you know, the president trying to blame, you know, Venezuelan agitators and, and you know, all the talk about, oh, this is just going to be another Venezuela. Um, but th that's, to me, that's kind of all fringe talk. Um, so I really, yeah, I really would like to read more careful research and analysis on how immigrants are, are living and experiencing these, these dynamics. Excellent. Um, we've had a request in the chat to end the screen share so that we can see the audience a little more. Um, so yes. if you can stop that one, I'll read the next question. 
Yes. Okay. Excellent. Great. Oh, yes. Now I can see you all. Now we can see each other. Excellent. Um, so our next oh, question cool, is from, cool. <laughs> um, our next question is from Cesar Noriega, who is a um, Chilean Argentine um, Argentina alumni who says, Dear Javiera, how do you anticipate that economic and political tensions will be managed when the constitutional convention start discussing thorny issues as pension private health care? Um, I don't know. Um, so today, finally, the um, head of the police force um, was forced to resign. So it's kind of the, the um, I don't know if he's the equivalent of the Secretary of Defense, but um, the head of the police force, which was something that people had been calling for for years, um, because he has presided over a great number of human rights abuses. Um, so he just resigned a couple of hours ago. Um, I was planning actually on checking the news again before connecting to see what had happened because the news sort of tends to move very quickly these days. Um, police reform is, is on the agenda given the events of the last year. Um, and so I think in terms of managing the tensions, it'll be interesting to see how far does the Congress and does the government, how far can they move along towards that reform process? Um, I think that will be a very important point. If they don't move very far enough along, we can, I think we can expect probably more violence, but also a very united front against that police violence. In a way, it's, um, it's a useful unifying um, tool in many ways. Excellent. Um, we have another question from Delilah who asked one earlier. She says, do you see the Chilean government doing anything about the private foreign corporations, like taking out the toll to use the highways for Chilean citizens? Well, for now, they've um, frozen prices um, and, and have done things like that, which um, were demanded as part of the estallido and then also became very useful during the COVID pandemic, right? Um, I don't think that there will be a radical change to the economic model in that sense. I have not seen anyone calling for, for example, like you know, the abolition of private property or um, very great changes to how private business can operate. It's more about empowering the state a little bit more, getting rid of this notion of the subsidiary state, replacing that with a notion of a state that can guarantee dignity, that can guarantee people's dignity. Um, and I think the big discussion will be to what extent the state can um, initiate its own um, businesses um, and its own initiatives. So for example, under the Chilean constitution, um, the, the, the state can't commercialize anything. And that will be a big thing. You know, can it expropriate water licenses? Can it expropriate mining licenses um, because of environmental concerns, because of drought? Um, can it really intervene in the health market, for example, with something like Covered California? To what extent can, can those things be allowed? That will, I think, is going to be where the discussions are rather than this sort of massive overhaul. Excellent. Shusa, would you like to take over? Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, from Madrid 2019, are voters being influenced by neighboring countries to demand their voice be heard in politics? Um, I think there's, I mean, well, it's been really nice on Twitter, at least. I don't know. I don't know how accurate this is or not. I'm a relatively, I only joined Twitter because of the estallido and the need to be informed of right. subway closures and of where our students might face harm. So I'm very new to this. But on Twitter, it's been really nice to see the solidarity with events in Peru and with Peruvian protest, protesters right now. Um, and so in that sense, I think there are some positive um, synergies. I think in general, um, the majority of Chileans and at least of Santiaguinos are very, um, you know, they're, they're very sympathetic to the political fights that, um, you know, neighboring societies have. Um, and so they're following some of the uh, more redistributive, more aggressively redistributive policies that the Fernandez government in Argentina is pursuing. Um, they're concerned about, you know, they're following also what's happening in Bolivia um, with optimism and hope. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, in that sense, it's, it's, um, it's a good time. And I think there, there's ongoing concern about what's happening in Venezuela in particular. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You mentioned the polls. This is Allison, Spain, 2004. You mentioned the polls. Any talk about mail-in voting or other solutions? Um, Allison mentions that my Tia in Vina was definitely feeling the COVID effect and was scared to vote, but a cousin dragged her and she reported a safe hygienic experience. Yeah, it's um, it was so fat. Like I was in California until a few days before the plebiscite, and just the the two election talks could not be more different. And there's pros and cons to each. Uh, you know, in Chile right now, um, voting is is voluntary, but it's automatic inscription, universal inscription. So there's not, and, and everyone has to have a national ID card. So there's none of this of like you have the right credentials and. There's kind of no way to really disenfranchise voters like you can in the United States, and you also don't have the problem with the gerrymandering and all of that. Um, on the other hand, voting is one day and one day only, and you need to get to your polling station, and that's it. If you don't make it, you don't vote. Um, and, and it's very difficult to change your voting location. So often people will move away and, and just keep their voting location and plan to travel back rather than go through the hassle of changing it. Um, so, so pros and cons to, to both. Um, I think it, it, was, it went off really well, the, the Servicio Electoral. I think um, you know, it's one of, probably one of the few really trusted institutions. They did an excellent job. Um, and, and we, we haven't seen a spike in cases. People were really concerned that because of protests, massive protests that happened the, for the 18th of October, then the voting a week later, that we would see three weeks later, big spike in cases. And we haven't, those case, COVID cases have continued to fall. So, so that's good. We're helped by the weather, you know, summer is coming. Yep. Yeah. We are nearing winter. I think it's hot there, isn't it? What is the temperature now? Is well, it? It's gotten a bit chilly this week. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so it's been quite yeah. variable. It's been right. very variable, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's about maybe 20, 25 degrees. Um, yeah. Kaylan from um, Chile 2018 um, asks, in your opinion, how can the reform process successfully address the fears of those with conservative ideology in Chilean upper classes, those who resist constitutional reform and strongly support property and business rights? I don't know. Um, I don't know, and, and it's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, the director of an important environmental NGO was asking me the same thing yesterday. And um, so it's something that those pushing for more radical changes are concerned about um, because, um, you know, part of the pushback this week to the, to the proposal by Camila Vallejo is that she wanted um, for the Constitutional Convention to be able to choose on their own, with their own autonomy, once it's constituted, how they're going to make decisions internally, whether they would make decisions by simple majority or two thirds majority or three fifths or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, some, the right wing is saying, no, the agreement we reached back in November said that those decisions have to be by two third majority. Of course, the writing is ambiguous. You can interpret it however you like. Um, and, and that two-thirds majority has been the traditional tool of the Chilean right to keep their veto power, right? To keep their one-third veto power. Um, so it's, it's symbolically, I think it's really a big thing, and it's also symbolically an important thing, and it speaks to what you're saying, this fear amongst the traditional uh, conservative classes of, of opening the, you know, what they call opening the floodgates of democracy and what the rest of us say like, yay, finally open the floodgates of democracy. Um, I don't know how it will play out entirely. I will say that after a few weeks of calm, after the plebiscite this week, protests started again. Um, and so um, tomorrow I expect there to be protests in Plaza Italia, 
Um, there's, and tonight, I think there's going to be a, a cacerolazo, pot banging, because the um, government, whose popularity is very low, had no better idea than to refloat the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the next phase in um, free trade globalization, for which there's uh, widespread opposition, not just here, but also in the US and lots of other countries. Um, so expect more protests. Excellent. Our next question comes from Zach Britton um, from our Madrid 87 group, who says, given the low support uh, for almost all Chilean institutions, politicians, Catholic Church, Carabineros, schools, etc., what voices do you think will be strongest during this constitutional process? That to me is like a huge question. I don't know. And I was very worried about this over the last few weeks, I've been thinking like, how is Chile going to do this given that there are no massive social organizations here? For example, there's no national indigenous movement. There's no, you know, it's not like Ecuador that has these really well organized social organizations and social movements. It's not like Brazil that has had them or has them still, or it's not like Argentina where you have, you know, trade unions that can you know, organize people that can tell them go to the street and then can tell them go home. You know, we've reached a negotiation. That doesn't happen in Chile. Chile, it is the street. But I was at a talk the other day with a Bolivian activist who reminded me that in 2003, when Bolivians began their uprising um, against uh, Losada before Mas and before Morales and before all of that, when that happened and they got Losada to resign and run away, Morales was in Geneva. No one at that time, you know, the mass didn't exist at that time. No one at that time thought it was going to become what it became later. And so in a way, maybe that will happen here. We will have new voices emerge. Um, I do think that we are here because of Camila Vallejo, Giorgio Jackson, and Boric, and the student movement leaders of 2011. Um, and they have emerged to me as, as really strong. They continue to, for me to be really strong, smart voices representing a variety of ideas, but um, all of them more progressive. So we will see. I mean, I hope we, we get more indigenous leaders that can, can play a greater protagonism nationally, um, but we really need a renovation of, of leadership and we need more grassroots mobilizing um there's in some ways you know i've been thinking a lot in terms of parallels with the u.s democratic party um that lost that capacity to just be out on the streets talking to people excellent um our next question comes from joseph argentina chile 2019 touching on something we discussed earlier what has the role of the uh, what has been the role of the mapuche in the last year how do their interests align or not align with the proposed changes and have they been disproportionately affected by COVID? That's a great question. I don't know if they have been disproportionately affected. Um, I know some communities sort of cordoned themselves off very soon into this. Um, others obviously weren't able to do that. I suspect that probably in urban areas like um, like La Pintana, you know, we, we, we always visit Una Ruca and um, some Mapuche leaders there who actually run a health center. Um, I imagine they have been disproportionately negatively impacted, uh, but hopefully in rural areas, maybe at least until now, um, maybe not so much, I don't know. I also cannot speak with any real knowledge or authority over the events of the last few months. Um, there's been a lot of arson, a lot of very violent attacks. Uh, people have been killed. Um, and and, is, and the, the land, the conflicts over land there run very, very deep. And there's, um, there's a tendency not to do a good job of explaining the local dynamics. There's a lot of local micro dynamics that are, um, that are really important. Um, so the Mapuche don't speak with a single unified voice. There's a lot of different um, political organizations and factions there. Um, and, and those have been kind of on display a lot over the last few months, um, given the violence um, that's been happening. Um, we'll see, you know, Piñera has, has now on his fourth Minister of the Interior. Um, so he's really become, become this um, very 
um, ineffective government, basically. Um, so we, we now have the new interior minister is younger than I am. He's from a uh, mayor of Estación Central, you know, sort of working class neighborhood in the heart of Santiago, which is great. Um, but, you know, I don't know how effective he will be when dealing with Araucanía, for example. But at least I, it may be better than the predecessor who was like more um, mano dura, like, uh, like a more violent, harsher person. I don't know. We need Thank a Mapuche you. specialist. Thank you, Javier. There, there is one last question on the chat, and, and, and it, coins, um, it aligns with one of my general questions, which is about you know, sharing your experience as far as the faculty director of Chile and Argentina. But Henry asks a more specific and more, probably more interesting question, uh, or at least more specific. What did you learn about being an educator during such a dynamic and transitional time in terms of methods and ways to utilize the moment as a learning experience for UCEAP students? Wow. Um, <laughs> I think, unfortunately, I don't think I've had a chance to really sit down and reflect on that because I haven't had any students. <laughs> um, you know, in fall 2019, we, we, we were really just sort of coping and focused on, on getting students to the end of the semester and finishing their classes and their internships and what needed to happen and monitoring the daily situation. Um, we had conversations, but they were all very informal. And then spring 2020, we worked really hard um, to, to find research and things that students would be able to do come what may. You know, that's how we saw it. Like, so even if the subway is totally off limits, at least they'll have a professor they can work with if they're doing research, things like that. And then, of course, COVID hit and changed everything. Um, so I've, I've um, I mean, I've had wonderful conversations with past students that I've just been in touch with, um, you know, now after the club visit, kind of like, hey, guys, you know, what you saw get started is now, you know, moved on to this next phase. Um, I will think about that because I think it's a really, I mean, I'm with some colleagues at Mona Damluji on campus at UCSB. We've been thinking for a while about how to use new technologies and, and videos and web-based things for teaching different kinds of things. Um, and, now, and now I'm hoping to get involved with some work in terms of translating like legal and policy issues to a broader audience, because that's what we hope to have in the Constitutional Convention. So how do you get people with no training in law um, to be able to engage with these things and to feel confident in, in their arguments. So I'm going to hopefully be getting involved with that and that would be a different kind of teaching, not, not a student, but um, helping to empower, you know, a budding politician. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we hope to have you back soon and then I will <laughs> put to the test what I learned. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I'm going to stop here. I, I, um, I think this conversation could continue and I have other questions, but we can, um, we can discuss them at another time. So I want to thank you so much um, for taking time and um, giving this presentation. Teach us a bit about the history of Chilean and, and this you know, moment of, of action with constitutional reform. We really appreciate getting a glimpse of that and, and what's happening currently um, there um, as, as you are, are, are uh, in Santiago. Um, I want to thank Bryn and Elizabeth for um, coordinating this series and um, we're so excited to have all of you here participating. So thank you again and I, I found it. It's in the reaction we can do our uh, virtual claps here. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Shuzu. Thank you, Javiera. Rin and I will send out an email um, to everyone just to give you um, a chance to give us any feedback and also suggestions for um, future topics um, or presenters. So thanks again. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.